Good morning, everyone. I have some uh, good news and some good news. Good news is I am not the cantor this morning. <laughs> Second good news is first I want to uh, welcome all of our guests today. Uh, we are honored by your presence and your participation. Always welcome at St. James. We mentioned last weekend that Bishop Brevard, who is the Bishop of St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, would be with us this weekend. And uh, he indeed is here, so I just want to say, Bishop, we are honored uh, by your presence with us. And so I said last night, uh, you're among uh, just a wonderful family of faith, people who are very generous and just very good. So we are really pleased that you're here. The opening hymn is number 551, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. So I ask the bishop to uh, please pray for me during Mass. I'll ask you to do the same. Shall we stand as we begin Holy Mass? everyone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, peace be with you. My dear brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess, to Almighty God, and, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words what I have done and what I have failed to do. To my fault, to my fault, to my most grievous fault. Therefore I am, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy.
Let us pray. O oh God, who teach us that what you abide in hearts that are just and true, grant that we may be so fashioned by your grace as to become a dwelling pleasing to you. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> It's my privilege this morning to invite the young people to come forward for the Liturgy of the Word. Goodness. Good morning. Good morning, Father. Yeah, all right. I've been elevated. <laughs> How many of you have good friends? Okay, put your hands down. How many of you have bad friends, enemies? Ooh. You know what Jesus teaches us today? We got to love them both. You think you could love your enemies? Yes. No. No? <laughs> Please. We got to learn that, don't we? So that's what you're all going to learn this morning. So I send you with God's blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you lead us? All right. A reading from the book of Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the whole Israelite community and tell them, Be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. You shall not bear hatred for your brother or your sister in heart. Though you may have to reprove your fellow citizen, do not incur sin because of him. Take no, re no grudge against any of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will, will destroy that person. For the temple of God, which you are, is holy. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you considers himself wise in this age, let him become a fool so as to become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of God. For it is written, God catches the wise in their own ruses. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. So let no one boast about human beings, for everything belongs to you, Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All belong to you and you to Christ and Christ to God. The word of the Lord. Be with you. A reading from our Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, Offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one as well. If anyone wants to go to law with you over your tunic, hand over your cloak as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not turn your back on one who wants to borrow. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father, for he makes his sun rise on the bad and the good, and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same? So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. As Father Martin was so kind at the beginning of Mass to tell you, my name is Bishop Herbert Bavard, and I have the honor and the pleasure of being the bishop of the smallest little diocese in the United States of America, the Diocese of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
and I'm here today to tell you something about our mission work and to ask you for your spiritual and financial assistance. But before I do that, I want to take a moment to thank Archbishop Kurtz for allowing me to come once again into the Archdiocese of Louisville to preach a mission retreat. I have been in the Archdiocese many times, and the people of the Archdiocese have been very, very generous and very, very supportive. Archbishop Kurtz and I are classmates from St. Charles Seminary and have been close friends since 1967. So that's a long time, and he certainly is a good friend to me and to many others, and especially to the church in the missions. I'm also very grateful to Father Martin Leinbach for allowing me to come here to St. James to preach this mission. You know, it is said that lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. Well, I think maybe that is not true. I think from time to time, maybe very rarely, not often, but it is possible that lightning could strike twice in the same place. But it doesn't usually follow someone around and strike him twice. Well, this is the second time that Father Martin has been my host. Once, some years ago at St. Patrick's, where he was the pastor, and now here in E-Town. So I'm very grateful to him for his kindness and for his great hospitality. I'm a bishop now for nine years, but I wasn't always a bishop. For 36 years, I was a parish priest in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. For 22 years, an assistant pastor in different parishes. And then for the last 14 years, I had the joy of being the pastor of a church called St. Athanasius. It was the largest and the most active and the fastest growing African-American parish in the city. And I was very, very happy there. I felt that the parish was just made for me and I was made for it, and we got along just fine. I thought I was going to grow old and die at St. Athanasius. Well, I managed to grow old there without any effort whatsoever. But I wasn't meant to die there because nine years ago, the phone rang on a Thursday afternoon in the rectory, and it was the papal nuncio telling me some very, very surprising news. First of all, that I was to become a bishop, and secondly, that I was to go to the Caribbean, to the island of St. Thomas, the Diocese of St. Thomas, to be the bishop there. Well, when he said that, I must have gasped with surprise, because he went on to say, don't be afraid. He said, I know it's far away, and I know it's very different from what you're used to, but it's so beautiful. He said, I would say the Holy Father is making you the bishop of paradise. So how could I say no when I was being offered paradise? If I was surprised, as truly I was, I guarantee you that most of the other priests in Philadelphia were even more surprised than I was. But in any case, surprised or not, off I went. Some of you have been to paradise. Maybe you were on a cruise and you stopped at St. Thomas for a day. Maybe. You were lucky enough to stay in one of our first-class, world-class, famous, beautiful resorts. Maybe you spent your honeymoon in the Virgin Islands. And if you have been there, you know the nuncio was telling the truth, with the exception, of course, of this great state of Kentucky. I would say the Virgin Islands have to be about the most beautiful place in the United States. The islands are filled with mountains. The mountains come tumbling down to the sea. From a distance, the sea is blue. When you get up close, it's perfectly clear. Beautiful flowers are always blooming. The birds are always singing. It's really very, very beautiful. Just like the nuncio said, in so many ways, a little bit of heaven on earth. That is the happy face, of course, that greets you when you come. And I've invited Father Martin, and you might as well come down next winter right along with him. When you get there, of course, that's the smiling, happy, golden face that you see. Nice, puffy, big cheeks, big smile, happy eyes. It says, welcome. This is a place for you to really enjoy. 
This is a wonderful, happy place. Come and have a good time. My dear friends, how I wish it were that face that brings me here as a bishop on my bended knee begging you for your charity today. But it is not. Because along with that happy face, there's another one, a face that our visitors and tourists seldom really see. And if they catch a glimpse of it, they don't see it for long. That second face is not full and happy. It's thin, it's gaunt, it looks hungry. In the eyes of that second face, there are tears. And very often, it's the face of an elderly person or of a child. It is that second reality that so often goes unseen that brings me to you today. Well now, when you arrive, it's nearly always the same story. Everybody gets their suitcases and they rent the car and off they go. First of all, through our capital, which is a town not as large as E-Town. It's very small, very Caribbean. You go through that and then you start to zigzag on the mountain roads until you reach the mountain top. And what a beautiful scene you will see there. You look out over the ocean, and the ocean from a distance is just as blue as blue can be. Up close, it's as clear as the air in this church. Fabulous. Now, I'm used to Ocean City, Maryland. This will be my 70th season going to Ocean City, Maryland. And you look out, the ocean is beautiful. But in the Virgin Islands, it's more beautiful because we have dozens and dozens of other islands. And the presence of those other islands peppered in the sea make it enchanted. It looks like Bally High. Well, you arrive there, you spend some time taking photos and ooing and eyeing and pointing things out. And then, of course, you notice it's check-in time. So you get back in the car, you wind down the mountains, along the ocean, through the mangrove swamp, and then eventually you turn to the right, you're pulling into the parking lot of your resort. Maybe it's the Marriott, the Frenchman's Reef, or maybe it's Belongo Bay Hotel, maybe it's Secret Harbor, or Elysian Fields, or Sugar Bay, or the Carambola, or the Buccaneer. We have many, many first-class, world-class resorts. You pull in, you park, you check in, you go up to your room out on the balcony, and there, my dear friends, is the paradise the nuncio told me about on the phone. Imagine it, a beautiful crescent-shaped beach. The palm trees are waving hello in the tropical breezes. The flowers are blooming, the birds are singing, people are in the water swimming getting a suntan on the beach, scuba diving, snorkeling, summer sailing. Others are having their luncheon served in cabanas. Oh, beautiful. My dear friends, I guarantee you that you will have the best vacation, the vacation of a lifetime. As you look upon that, you will congratulate yourself and you'll say, this is going to be a wonderful week or two in my life. And my dear friends, it will be. It certainly will be, unless. Unless when the plane lands and you get your bags in the car, unless when you grow up to the mountaintop and take some photos, unless when you come down again and drive along the ocean and through the hills a little bit. Unless when you come to that crossroads, instead of turning to the right into the parking lot of a beautiful resort, you make a mistake. And you turn, let's say, instead to the left. God forbid you and your family might end up in a terrible place, and we have many of them, 
Maybe you would end up in a place called Bavoni or Nada or Friedendale or Mariendale or Hospital Grounds or Savan or Friedenborg or some other terrible place, the like of which you have never seen. Now, I was a pastor in the inner city of Philadelphia for 14 years. I'm pretty familiar with West Louisville. I know about a lot of the slummy areas in some of our cities. That's one thing. But the poverty in the Caribbean is much worse. And it doesn't matter on what island it exists. It's nearly always the same story. There are some people like you and me who are blessed with many things. And then there are some who have absolutely nothing. They live with their children day by day, meal to meal, and have really nothing to rely on except your charity and the work of the Catholic Church. Well, now, when I arrived at St. Thomas and was made a bishop, I sat down with the priests, and they gave me a whole long shopping list of things they wanted the new bishop to do. When I looked at the list, I thought, well, they must think I have a magic wand, and I can wave it around and make all the troubles disappear. Well, I have no magic wand. I have something much better. I have you. I have the generosity and the faith and the goodness of many, many Christ-minded, mission-minded people who love God, who love the church, and who are very, very willing to do whatever they can to see the church grow and to fulfill the commandment made by our Lord to go out to all nations with the faith. One of the things the priest mentioned was our cathedral, an old building, 168 years old when I arrived. They said, Bishop, it's going to collapse. One good-sized hurricane or earthquake, and down it will come. It's structurally unsound. You have to do something. Well, my dear friends, I'm glad to tell you that after nine years, with the help of God and his blessed mother, the cathedral has been restored. That job is just about done. And when you come down, you will see a very, very beautiful, beautiful cathedral. And it's safe. It's not going to collapse and kill you. They said, Bishop, our schools. Our schools are so important. They're very small. They're very poor. We don't have any bells, and we don't have any whistles, and we don't have any Dominican sisters to staff our schools. How I wish we did. But our schools are good. We teach, first and foremost, the Catholic faith, not a watered-down, look-alike version but the same faith that you learn from the good sisters or from your mother at her knee when you were a child. We teach it and we teach it well. Our children know the faith, they love the faith, and they practice the faith. So the schools are important for the faith. They're also important academically. We teach the academic subjects and nearly 100% of our graduates go on to college, especially up here in the States. So our schools are so important. If you work for a company and that company were to transfer you to St. Thomas or St. Croix or St. John next week, there would be a Catholic school that you could send your little son or daughter to and you wouldn't have to be a millionaire to do it. Our schools are staying open. Catholic Charities is the crown jewel in our lives. You would be so proud to be a Catholic if you toured all the many things that are done for the poor in the Virgin Islands. We have soup kitchens where many, many people eat all the time. I believe last year we served 55,000 meals. We have homeless shelters. You know, in the Virgin Islands, you don't have to sleep on a subway grill like you do in Philadelphia or New York. It never gets cold. But believe me, it's a terrible thing to be homeless in the Virgin Islands, to sleep 
in the public, on a beach, on a park bench, on the street. You are not safe by any matter of means. And so we have homeless shelters. We homeless many, many people, and we sponsor many other programs to help those who have no homes move in the direction of obtaining a home. We have all kinds of clothing distribution centers. We're doing a good job. Recently, we opened a new soup kitchen uh, on the West End of Charlotte Amalia, and then uh, I had the pleasure of blessing and opening uh, a chapel and a, a food distribution center, a soup kitchen, for people, especially from Haiti. And at the same time, God sent us a priest who speaks Creole. And so that's a wonderful gift that he has given us that we can pass on to those who really need it the most. The Catholic Charities is so important, but my dear friends, believe me, it holds on by the skin of its teeth. We get involved with many government programs. They grant us money to run things that they can't run for themselves and that nobody else can run. And so often they're very late in paying. And recently they haven't paid at all. You've read, I'm sure, about what happened in Puerto Rico. We are the next in line. As I stand here today, the government owes us nearly a quarter of a million dollars that we have put out and not been reimbursed. And I don't think they have any intention or even the ability to repay that amount. As a result, I had to cut the salary of every single employee for Catholic Charities by 13% two weeks ago. But God bless them, the people said, well, I, some job is better than no job, and they're dedicated, they look upon it as a vocation, and so we continue to exist. My dear friends, the priest gave me many other things they wanted to happen. If I went through them, this mass would be entirely too long. But let me just say, our needs are many, our needs are serious, and we rely very heavily on the goodness of your hearts. Now, because of the charity of Archbishop Kurtz and your good pastor, the second collection this morning will come entirely to help us do God's work in the Virgin Islands. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for anything you throw into that second collection. But I know that for some of you, this is not a good time. Uh, maybe you didn't realize this collection was being uh, taken up, or maybe it's not a good time for some other reason. Well, I solved that problem for you before you even knew you had a problem. In the pews are these beautiful golden envelopes uh, I think they're at the end of every single pew. If this isn't a good time, take one of these home with you and make your donation when it suits you. There will never come a time when we don't need it, and your money will be just as green in July as it is in February. So whenever it's good for you, it's wonderful for us. Now, believe it or not, I have quite a large supply of these envelopes. So please feel free to take some home with you. That's your missionary duty. Maybe you can't go to the Virgin Islands or to Africa or Asia, but still, there's so much you can do for the missions in prayer and in work. And so accept the work and take some of these home, pray about it, think about it, plan it, and see where you can plant the seed where it might take root and grow and produce fruit for our Lord and for his poor. Maybe, for example, you live next to a millionaire, or if you do, make sure you put one of these through the hedge. Or maybe uh, you didn't celebrate last week International Mother-in-Law's Day. Now, if you didn't give something to your mother-in-law, now's your chance to make up for it. Uh, these make wonderful ways to memorialize her, to give something in her name and I'm sure that will make her very happy. And by the way, I happen to know that not a single person in the church this morning celebrated International Mother-in-Law's Day because I just made it up this morning. <laughs> but now she's heard about it, so this is your answer. 
plant the seed where you think it might grow. Well now, priests and sisters who have been missionaries a lot longer than nine years tell me you have to finish up with a story that the people will remember. The people want to hear a story about the missions. This morning I have a story about the missions. It's a true story. It's a sad story. And believe me, you will remember it. If next week somebody says, what did that priest from the Caribbean have to say? You may forget what I've said. You may say, well, I think he wanted some money. But you'll remember the story. This is a memorable story. On the island of St. Croix, there was a shanty town named Friedenborg. Now, it's been bulldozed because it was just so terrible. It was so dangerous. It was so filthy. It was incredible. People there live in cardboard boxes, in huts made out of tin, maybe in an abandoned car. Sometimes they find a, a small boat, it's leaky, and they overturn it, and they and their children sleep under it to stay out of the rain. It's a place of hunger, it's a place of desperation, it's a place of crime, it's a place that you wouldn't want to be. Well, from time to time, I go there, and believe me, I'm the most popular priest you've ever seen. You'd be amazed. The children come running from all sides to see the bishop. Now, of course, I happen to have with me a bag of candy and a bag of fruit. And that's really what they have in mind. They come running, they get the candy first, of course, and then the fruit, and then they disappear, and then I disappear. Well, one day I was there, the kids had come, I gave out everything I had, they had gone away, and I was turning to get into my car when I happened to notice up on the hillside there was a cabin, a little shack, and the door opened and a little boy came out. And I could see that he had spotted me. And I knew, of course, exactly what was going to happen. I knew he would get down the hill and that he'd want something and that I had nothing for him. Sure enough, that's exactly what he did. He came running as fast as he could. He came up to me and he said, Father, what do you have to eat? I said, I don't have anything left. It's all gone. The other children were here and I gave everything I brought with me today. He said, well, I'm hungry. I said, well, you're going to have to go back up the hill to your house. It's lunchtime. Find your mother and she'll give you some lunch. Well, my dear friends, he looked up at me and he said some words that I will never forget. He said, I just saw my mother, and she told me that today was not my turn to eat. Michael, she said, today isn't your turn to eat. Today it's your sister's turn to eat. My dear friends, can you imagine if ever in your life you had had to say those words to your child? Today, you're not going to eat. Well, I went up the hill with Michael. I solved his problem for a little while, I guess. On the way home, I fantasized and I imagined what would have happened if he had nagged at his mother long enough. How about if he had fussed at her long enough, maybe she would have gotten frustrated, and maybe eventually she would have said, Michael, for the love of God, don't be so selfish. Well, my dear friends, what do you think? In the eyes of heaven, it's not Michael who's selfish. Maybe it's the Bishop of the Virgin Islands who has that problem. Maybe it's some of us who are not as generous to God and to the church and to the missions as we really want to be, as we would like to be. But life has so many obligations, it's easy to become concentrated on other things. So I come to you today begging for all the different kinds of Michaels who know all the different kinds of poverty known to man. I ask you for your 
kindness, and generosity. I also ask you for your prayers. First and foremost, of course, to our divine Lord and the blessed sacrament, the Lord of the harvest. There's nothing wrong with him as Lord. The problem is he has to use some pretty broken, dull tools. So ask him to sharpen us up and to help us to really be good instruments of his love and kindness and mercy. And then, of course, pray to our Blessed Mother, the Queen of the Missions. My dear friends, if you haven't been paying attention, if you've been glancing at the bulletin, if you've been checking your watch to see if it's still working, that's okay, you're forgiven. There's another missionary on his way, and he'll preach a better sermon than the one you've just heard. But pay attention to this. Take this home, and it's the honest-to-God truth. Everything the Blessed Virgin Mary touches turns to gold. Everything Our Lady touches turns to gold. How could it possibly be otherwise? She is the mother of Jesus Christ. So how could she take anything to her heart and it not be changed? And so give Our Lady your life, your spiritual life, your eternal salvation, your marriage, your family, your children, your grandchildren, your career, your hopes, your failures, your sorrows, your joys. Give everything to Mary. And my dear friends, I can prove it. Like many of you, I'm a convert to the Catholic faith. I decided to become a Catholic when I was a very little boy. I was 11 years old, and my parents were very unhappy with that. And uh, we lived in Maryland. You know, in the South, there's a cure for children who displease their parents. It's called military school. And so my father said, you don't want to be a Catholic, you want to be a cadet, you want to go to military school. So off I went. I wasn't allowed to go into a Catholic church for seven years. I wasn't allowed to say hello to a Catholic priest for seven years. I never even knew a sister or a nun. No contact at all. But I had the rosary. And I said it in my own Protestant way, I admit, but I said it nonetheless. For my conversion, and for my parents and my family. I couldn't understand why immediately the Blessed Mother didn't show my parents the light. But I never gave up. I prayed it faithfully every day for seven years. Well, when I became a senior and graduated, my father permitted me to be baptized. I entered the church, and I was ordained in 1972. My mother, who cried her eyes out when I said I wanted to be a Catholic, converted in 1976. My father converted in 1987, and I have one brother who just passed away, but two years before he died, out in Lincoln, Nebraska, he became a Catholic. So the Blessed Mother turned what I gave her to gold in her good time. Don't forget, God's time is always on time. We get impatient, but be patient, and she will change whatever you give her to gold. And then pray to our two patron saints. One, St. Francis Xavier. What a he-man. What a man's man. What a God's man. He walked all the way from Europe to China with the gospel, with the sacraments, with the faith. What a fabulous example we have in St. Francis Xavier. And then there's another patron saint, and I have to admit, I love her even more than St. Francis Xavier. She was just a young girl, pure, beautiful, innocent, filled with the love of God, filled with charity. All she wanted was to become a nun. And she was so young she had to go to Rome to get the Pope's permission. And he gave it, and she went back to her native country. She entered Carmel. She was a cloistered nun for just a few years because she died very, very early. And she prayed. She never went to Africa or Asia or the Virgin Islands. She never left that convent again. But she prayed, and she prayed so beautifully and so well, her prayers were answered so often that she became once she was canonized, 
the second patroness of foreign missions. And I can tell by some of your faces, you know her, St. Teresa, the little flower of Jesus. What a super saint God in his goodness has given us. What a friend we have in heaven. St. Teresa, the little flower. So tonight, before you go to sleep, please say a prayer for my people that they will remain true to their Catholic faith. I know there's a lot of anti-Catholicism, especially in the past in Kentucky. Well, we have it in big measure in the Virgin Islands. We're only 20% of the population. So pray that the people will remain true to their holy Catholic faith. Pray for my priests. I have good, holy, hardworking priests. But believe me, it's hard work in the heat day by day. It's frustrating. Pray to God that they won't get discouraged, that they won't give up, that they'll continue to love their vocation as missionaries. And then, if you're not too sleepy, say a little prayer for the Bishop of St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, that God will touch my heart, Our Lady will touch my heart and the saints, and make me into the kind of missionary bishop that they want this parish priest from Philadelphia to be. Thank you so much, and may God bless you all. I believe in one God, the Father, the... We turn to God our Father and to Christ who intercedes for us at his right hand. For Holy Mother Church and all her pastors, may the Holy Spirit guide them to serve those entrusted to their care to become perfect in love and mission. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For public servants in our world, nation, commonwealth, and our community of Elizabethtown, May they provide leadership and promotes, that promotes justice, ensures domestic tranquility, provides for the common good, promotes the general welfare, and secures the blessings of liberty to all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Bishop Bavard and the people of the Diocese of St. Thomas, may our financial support help them to provide an excellent ministry and care to his people and for our brothers and sisters of St. Mark's Parish in Haiti. Let us remember them all at the altar of the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are separated or alienated from those they love, for the forgotten or ignored, for those suffering in any way, may they experience in us the kindness and mercy of God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For all our family members, friends, and benefactors who have died, we pray especially for Bob Zogelman and for the deceased members of the Reeser and McCamish, McCamish families for whom this Mass is offered. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. 
O Lord God, Father of, of us all, hear the prayers we make to you for every member of the human family. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The hymn for the preparation of the gifts is number 626, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, number 626. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. As we celebrate your mysteries, O Lord, with the observance that is your due, we humbly ask you that what we offer to the honor of your majesty may profit us for salvation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Father most holy, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your word, through whom you made all things, whom you sent as our Savior and Redeemer, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin, fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. And so, with the angels and all the saints, we declare your glory as with one voice we acclaim. indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more, giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Joseph, our Bishop, me, your unworthy servant, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, with the Blessed Apostles, Saint James, and with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, O Lord, we pray, from every evil and graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may always be free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of God's peace and love. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. O Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. I am the bread of life, number 828. The body of Christ.
Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that we may experience the effects of the salvation which is pledged to us by these mysteries. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. To Jesus Christ, our Sovereign King, number 488.